Hi, it's Samuel Campbell again, Brighton-based actor represented by John Money Management. Today I'm going to be reading for you uh, the second chapter of Ian Nesbitt's The Treasure Seekers, called Digging for Treasure. I'm afraid the last chapter was rather dull. It's always dull in books when people talk and talk and don't do anything. But I was obliged to put it in, or else you wouldn't have understood all the rest. The best part of books is when things are happening. That is the best part of real things, too. This is why I shall not tell you in the story about all the days when nothing happened. You will not catch me saying, thus the days rolled on their weary course, or time went on. Because it is silly. Of course time goes on, whether you say so or not. So I shall just tell you the nice, interesting parts. And in between, you will understand that we had our meals and got up and went to bed and dull things like that. It would be sickening to write all that down. Though, of course, it happens. I said so to Albert next door's uncle, who writes books. He said, quite right. That's what we call selection a necessity of true art, and he is very clever indeed. So you see, I've often thought that if people who write children's books knew a little more, it would be better. I shall not tell you anything about us except what I should like to know if I was reading this story that you were writing. Albert's uncle says, I ought to have put this in the preface, but I never read prefaces and it's not so good writing things for people who just skip it. I wonder other authors have never thought of this. Well, when we had agreed to dig for treasure, we all went down into the cellar and lighted the gas. Oswald would have liked to dig there, but it has stone flags. We looked among the old boxes and broken chairs and fenders and empty bottles and things, And at last we found the spades we had to dig in the sand when we went to the seaside three years ago. They're not silly, babyish wooden spades that split if you look at them, but good iron with a blue mark across the top of the iron part and yellow wooden handles. We wasted a little time getting them dusted because the girls wouldn't dig with spades that had cobwebs on them. Girls would never do for African explorers or anything like that. They're too beastly particular. It was no use doing things by half. We marked out a sort of square in the mouldy part of the garden, about three yards across, and began to dig. But we found nothing except worms and stones, and the ground was very hard. So we thought we'd try another part of the garden, and we found a place in the big round flower bed where the ground was much softer. We thought we'd make a smaller hole to begin with and it was much better. We dug and dug and dug and it was jolly hard work. We got very hot digging and we found nothing. Presently, Albert next door looked over the wall. We did not like him very much. But we let him play with us sometimes, because his father is dead. And you must not be unkind to orphans, even if their mothers are still alive. Albert is always very tidy. He wears frilly collars and velvet knickerbockers. I can't think how he could bear to. So we said, hello. And he said, what are you up to? We're digging for treasure, said Alice. An ancient parchment revealed to us the place of concealment. Come over and help us. When we have dug deep enough, we shall find a great pot of red clay, full of gold and precious jewels. Albert next door only sniggered and said, What silly nonsense! He cannot play properly at all. It is very strange, because he has a very nice uncle. You see... Albert next door doesn't care much for reading, and he has not read nearly so many books as we have. 
So he's very foolish and ignorant. But it cannot be helped. You just have to put up with it when you want him to do anything. Besides, it is wrong to be angry with people for not being as clever as yourself. It is not always their fault. So Oswald said, Come and dig. Then you shall share the treasure when we have found it. But he said, I shan't. I don't like digging, and I'm just going in for my tea. Come along and dig. There's a good boy, Alice said. You can use my spade. It's much the best. So he came along and dug. And when once he was over the wall, we kept him at it. And we worked as well, of course. And the hole got deep. Pincher worked too. He's a dog, and he's very good at digging. He digs for rats in the dustbin sometimes, and gets very dirty. But we love our dog, even when his face wants washing. I expect we shall have to make a tunnel, Oswald said, to reach the rich treasure. So he jumped into the hole and began to dig at one side. After that we took turns to dig at the tunnel, and Pincher was almost useful in scraping the earth out of the tunnel. He does it with his back feet when you say rats. And he digs with his front ones and burrows with his nose as well. At last the tunnel was nearly a yard long and big enough to creep along to find the treasure. If only it was a bit longer. Now it was Albert's turn to go in and dig, but he funked it. Take your turn like a man, said Oswald. Nobody can say that Oswald didn't take his turn. But Albert wouldn't, so we had to make him, because it was only fair. It's quite easy, Alice said. You just crawl in and dig with your hands. Then when you come out, we can scrape out what you have done with the spades. Come on, be a man. You won't notice it being dark in the tunnel if you shut your eyes tight. We've all been in, except Dora. She doesn't like worms. I don't like worms either, Albert next door said but we remember how he had picked up a fat red and black worm in his fingers and thrown it at Dora only the day before. So we put him in. But he would not go in head first, the proper way, and dig with his hands as we had done. And though Oswald was angry at the time, he hates snivellers. Yet afterwards, he owned that perhaps it was just as well. You should never be afraid to own that perhaps you were mistaken. But it is cowardly to do it unless you are quite sure you are in the wrong. Let me go in feet first, said Albert next door. I'll dig with my boots. I will truly honours. So we let him get in feet first. And he did it very slowly. And at last he was in the hole. Only his head sticking out. And all the rest of him in the tunnel. Now dig with your boots, said Oswald. And Alice, do catch Pincher. He'll be digging again in another minute, and perhaps it would be uncomfortable for Albert if Pincher threw the mould into his eyes. You should always try to think of these little things. Thinking of other people's comfort makes them like you. Alice held Pincher, and we all shouted, Kick! Dig with your feet for all you're worth! So Albert next door began to dig with his feet, and we stood on the ground over him, waiting. And all in a minute the ground gave way, and we tumbled, together, in a heap. And when we got up, there was a little shallow hollow where we'd all been standing, and Albert next door was underneath, stuck quite fast, because the roof of the tunnel had tumbled in on him. He is a horribly unlucky boy to have anything to do with. It was dreadful, the way he cried and screamed. Though he had to own, it didn't hurt. Only it was rather heavy, and he couldn't move his legs. We would have dug him out, all right, in time, but he screamed, so we were afraid the police would come. So Dickie climbed over the wall to tell the cook there to tell Albert next door's uncle he had been buried by mistake, and to come and help to dig him out. Dickie was a long time gone. We wondered what had become of him. 
and all the while the screaming went on and on, for we had taken the loose earth off of Albert's face so that he could scream quite easily and comfortably. Presently, Dickie came back, and Albert next door's uncle came with him. He has very long legs, and his hair is light, and his face is brown. He has been to sea, but now he writes books. I like him. He told his nephew to stow it, so Albert did, and then he asked him if he was hurt, and Albert had to say that he wasn't. For though he is a coward, and very unlucky, he's not a liar like some boys are. This promises to be a protracted, if agreeable, task, said Albert next door's uncle, rubbing his hands and looking at the hole with Albert's head in it. I will get another spade. So he fetched a big spade out of the next door garden tool shed and began to dig his nephew out. Mind you keep very still, he said, or I might chunk a bit out of you with the spade. Then after a while he said, I confess that I'm not absolutely insensible to the dramatic interest of the situation. My curiosity is excited. I own that I should like to know how my uncle, my nephew, happen to be buried. But don't tell me if you'd rather not. I suppose no force was used? Only moral force, said Alice. They used to talk a lot about moral force at the high school where she went. And in case you don't know what it means, I'll tell you that it is making people do things that they don't want to do, just by slanging them, or laughing at them, or promising them things if they're good. Only moral force, said Albert next door's uncle. Well, well, Dora said, I'm very sorry it happened to Albert. I'd rather it had been one of us. It would have been my turn to go into the tunnel, only I don't like worms, so they let me off. You see, we were digging for treasure. Yes, said Alice, and I think we were just coming to the underground passage that leads to the secret hoard. When the tunnel fell in on Albert, he is so unlucky, and she sighed. Then Albert next door began to scream again, and his uncle wiped his face, his own face, not Albert's, with his silk handkerchief, and then put it in his trousers pocket. It seems a strange place to put a handkerchief, but he had his coat and waistcoat off, and I suppose he wanted a handkerchief handy. Digging is warm work. He told Albert next door to drop it, or he wouldn't proceed any further in the matter. So Albert stopped screaming, and presently his uncle finished digging him out. Albert did look so funny, and his hair all dusty, with his velvet suit covered with mould, and his face muddy with earth and crying. We all said how sorry we were, but he wouldn't say a word back to us. He was most awfully sick to think he'd been the one that was buried, when it might just as well have been one of us. I felt myself that it was hard lines. So, you were digging for treasure, said Albert next door's uncle, wiping his face again with his handkerchief. Well, I feel your chances of success are small. I have made a careful study of the whole subject. What I don't know about buried treasure is not worth knowing and I never know more than one coin buried in any one garden. And that is generally, Hello, what is this? He pointed to something shining in the hole he had just dragged Albert out of. Oswald picked it up. It was a half crown. We looked at each other, speechless, with surprise and delight, like in books. Well, that's lucky in all events, said Albert next door's uncle. Let's see. That's five pence each for you. It's four pence something. I can't do fractions, said Dickie. There are seven of us. You see. Oh, you count Albert as one of yourselves on this occasion, said. Of course, said Alice. And I say he was buried after all. Why shouldn't we let him have the odd somethings? And we'll have four pence each. We all agreed to do that and told Albert next door we would bring his share as soon as we could get the half-crown changed. 
He cheered up a little at that, and his uncle wiped his face again. He did look hot, and began to put on his coat and waistcoat. When he had done it, he stopped and picked up something. He held it up, and you would hardly believe it, but it is quite true. It was another half crown. To think there should be two. In all my experience of buried treasure, he said, I'd never heard of such a thing. I wish Albert next door's uncle would come treasure seeking with us regularly. He must have sharp eyes. For Dora says she was looking just that minute before at the very place where the second half crown was picked up from. And she never saw it.